Hello, welcome back everyone. You know, they say in space, nobody can hear you scream. And today we're gonna test that out. Let's see what happens to sound waves in a vacuum chamber. So today I have this very loud alarm clock. Let's put the alarm clock inside of the vacuum chamber and see what happens to the sound. All right, so let's see how this thing sounds without any vacuum chamber at all and get a baseline here. Pretty loud, put it in there. And we're reading about maybe 75 decibels or so. I want to call your attention not only to the decibels, but to the frequency spectrum here. When I turn it on, look at the high frequencies and look how the high frequencies in particular jump up here. All right, obviously a bell has some high frequency components. So let's put the vacuum chamber in place. All right, we have the clock on, we're going in. Top is on. Notice that quiets it down quite a bit. And three, two, one, pumps coming on. We're already coming and approaching half of an atmosphere. Here we are at half of atmospheric pressure. We're about 65, 66. Notice that even here, just a little bit beyond atmospheric pressure, I notice that I can see that it's, it's doing its thing, but I can't hear it very much. All right, let me turn the pump on. We're getting down here to about one quarter of an atmosphere, approaching one quarter of an atmosphere. And we can definitely see the decibels are going down and the high frequency component is dropping also. All right, now we're at about a quarter of an atmosphere. It's gonna take the pump a little bit of time to get past this and get into a deep vacuum. Let's listen to what it sounds like now. So now what I hear is a little bit of a rattling sound, but not so much of a ringing sound. So when I stop talking, Looks like it's resting about 71 or 61 here. It's resting about 61, and the high frequency component is much, much lower. All right, let's get into the highest vacuum we can with this. All right, so down about 61, and notice the high frequency component is just through the floor. It's much, much lower because the bell is high frequencies. Dipping into 59, even when I put my microphone really, really close, let's listen. Okay, I can't hear much of anything other than a rattling sound, a little bit of a bell sound way in the background. It's coming from vibrations through the, the surface of the chamber because vibrations can go down through the clock into the bottom of the chamber and then up to the sides and I can still hear a little bit of it, but obviously there's almost nothing there. So now what I'm gonna do is let the air back in and we'll listen and we'll watch the decibels climb as we go from vacuum up to atmospheric pressure. Here we go. Whenever we get back into atmospheric pressure. And notice we can obviously hear it. Let me put my mic a little closer. All right, what happened there? Well, we take all the air out of the chamber and we know that sound waves propagate through air. So we expect the sound to go down, but it's still a pretty impressive demonstration of that because this bell is really, really loud. And almost immediately you can hear it kind of back off of the volume of the sound, but then right around half atmosphere into a quarter of an atmosphere, it just tapers down to where I can almost not hear it at all. And then when we get down to the highest vacuum this thing can do, which is just a little bit less than maybe a 10th or 5% of, of an atmospheric pressure, then I can't really hear anything, just a little rattling going on, a little tiny bit of a bell sound through the, the vibrations transmitted through the, the structure here, but that's all I can hear. And so if you could take your helmet off in space and scream at the top of your lungs or on the moon, there's literally no air there. So your vocal cords would be vibrating, but since there's no air for the molecules to, to propagate the energy, then literally nothing will happen. No energy will leave your body. You'll, you'll have the vibrations in your vocal cords, but nothing will transmit out. And so in space, nobody can hear you scream. Exactly correct. Now, of course, we cannot take our helmet off in space anyway, because you know it's very cold in space, you can't breathe in space and so on. So there's a lot of problems with that. But the idea of sound waves not being able to propagate at all, even though we know why it should happen, is very weird to watch in person. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about sound waves and how they propagate, and I have another little demo to show you that. Okay, so here's our little slinky representing the air, and I can shoot a compression wave through it like this. You can see the, the wave go to the end and bounce, and bounce all the way back to where my heather hand is. I can stretch it out further, do the same thing, now this is called a compression wave, where we're changing 
we're pushing our hand into the direction of the medium. Now I want us to explore what would happen to this air if I could put my hand here and just kind of push on the air rapidly. So as my hand comes to this portion of the air, I'm going to very slightly increase the, the closeness of these air molecules in this tube, much as you would see in this drawing right here. So over here, what I've done is I've moved my hand very, very rapidly, and I've very rapidly and quickly compressed the air, which means I've made the average distance between the molecules much, much closer. So as soon as I begin to compress it, it wants to spring back and fly apart again, because when I compress it, the collisions are happening more frequently. And so as I compress it here, then immediately the gas is going to want to spread out. And the net effect of that is this little pressure region moves a little bit to the right because as it spreads out and I've imparted it uh, with energy this way, it's going to begin to want to spread out and the whole uh, high pressure area is going to move this way. It might spread out and diffuse a little bit, but it's in general going to want to move a little bit uh, to the right hand side. Now, what if I do that over and over and over again? I do it very, very regularly. Or instead of thinking of my hand, think about your vocal cords vibrating. Anything that vibrates with a regular repetition is what we consider something that makes sound, okay? So think about a tuning fork, banging a tuning fork. You can see the vibration in the tines of the tuning fork, and that is moving the surrounding air, which is generating a regular and repeating pressure pattern in the air which travels away. Then I'm going to create these regular regions of pressure, and the regular regions of pressure are going to be moving in the direction that I've begun the vibration to happen. So then we can look at the distance in centimeters or meters between the high pressure areas which are regular and repeating, and we can call that what we call a wavelength. So when you hear about the wavelength of sound waves or the wavelength of any kind of wave, it's the physical distance in meters or centimeters between uh, uh, repeating patterns in the wave. So we're going from high pressure down to low, back to high, that's a one cycle of back to high pressure that's called the wavelength. It might be five centimeters, or it might be three centimeters, or it might be something much longer. Wavelengths are true for sound waves, they're true for light waves, they're true for water waves, they're true for any kind of wave with a repeating pattern. They all have what we call a wavelength. Now, if you graph this, and you can say that this is high pressure. You can graph this on a graph and you can say, well, that's a high pressure. This is a lower pressure. So you can label this axis pressure, right? And it goes back to high pressure and then back to low pressure and then back to high pressure again. Then you can connect them in a smooth curve and get that typical wave looking pattern that we always see. When you, uh, you, know, you, you see a sound wave or even a light wave or a water wave represented as a wave, you see the crests and the troughs. That's where it comes from. High pressure is the top part of the wave. Low pressure is the low part of the wave. And the distance to where the wave repeats itself is called the wavelength. That's the same wavelength as what we drew up here, represented in a different way. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you found something interesting and educational out of it. If you'd like to see more like this, please drop me a line. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.